confident in policing. People are more confident in policing in Hertfordshire than anywhere else in the country, and the level of confidence is higher than they have in John Lewis at about 87%. I've recruited more frontline officers than just about anywhere else, and that's thanks to the prudent budgeting that we have done. I haven't charged council taxpayers a penny more for policing in my time here. If you go into Bedfordshire, they were trying to charge 15% more last year for policing. Similar sorts of areas, different way of delivering. So you're not having to pay a penny more, crime is down, and perhaps most importantly of all, uh, neighbourhood policing has been saved. Not because the constabulary think that's the right model, but because I think that's the right model, because frankly, you all want to know that wherever you live, you have, in your area, a local police force which reflects that locality and has a local chief inspector in it and a local police station out of which they work. Those are things which I'm very, very proud of. Up and down the land, victims have become the centre of policing and that has been the real change. Police are really great at chasing criminals and of course that's their job and that's quite right and proper. But I feel really proud that we put at the heart victims. That's why I'm wearing the victims uh, badge today. It's quite helpful actually. It's a nice blue badge. <laughs> I think the constabulary should wear one of these for the next six months to show that they too <laughs> think the victims should be at the heart of everything that we want to do. I am uh, really certain that uh, the role of PCC is one which has made a huge difference. I'm really certain that the role of PCC has increased transparency and has made people in this county even more confident that their crimes are being taken seriously where they occur and that they <coughs> can hold their police force to account as rightly they should through me. I think it has been a great success and with one minute left I will say it really is something that I have been delighted to be involved in. But I think to go back to those original um, words about is it a journey, if it's a journey, you know, we've got a long way, we've gone further than perhaps we thought we would in the first three years, but we've got um, some way to go yet. And I am that person to finish that job for you. And I think that I will be re-elected if I stand as Police and Crime Commissioner to finish that job for you. I'll be very happy to take questions. Okay. Many thanks, David. Right. Uh, we're going to take questions now, and I would be grateful if you could stand up, say your name. Can you all hear? Yes. Right, okay. Say, say your name, and what part of the county you're actually from, so we can actually see if we've got a cross section of the county here this evening. Okay, Richard, we'll start with you at the back. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Smith, I represent Welling on the County Council, and I'm a former member of the Police Authority. David, I've asked you this question before, but I'd like to give you the opportunity in front of this audience to say again, what is your view about the future of neighbourhood policing and specifically the role of the PCSOs. We've all read recently rumours that the Met are thinking of abandoning the role completely. Could you tell us how you feel about it, please? Well, um, I don't know if that's better with this on. Is that better for some people with it on? I'll, I'll, I'll keep it on. Um, the role of PCSOs is part of that wider uh, policing family. PCSOs, police. Uh, community support officers, they're the people who, um, whilst they can't arrest, um, they can be out there in the community uh, helping to uh, make sure that uh, people feel reassured and actually still bringing a lot of information backwards and forwards. Um, PCSOs have been a really great um, uh, example of partnership working. You'll remember um, back in the day, I see uh, um, that uh, David's here, back in the day when uh, Dave was leading, we, uh, we, we introduced PCSOs, I think, uh, just about that, that time. And uh, um, they were introduced, really, through the county council. Um, there was this buy one, get one free offer. 
um, they uh, are still there policing and doing really well. I was never a huge fan of PCSOs until there was the near riot in 2011 in, uh, in the southern area of Broxbourne, in Waltham Cross. Yeah. And the reason there wasn't a riot in Waltham Cross wasn't because um, of our police officers. It was because our PCSOs, who were out there all the time, saw the various people who were just about to break into a burglar, uh, into a jeweller's and sort of start uh, a riot off. And uh, it's very difficult if uh, you know the names of each of those people to then say, oh, oh yes, I'm actually going to continue with this crime. And they stopped there and then. And that struck me why they work so well as part of that family. So I intend to keep, uh, we've got enough money to be able to keep Naval the Policing, we've got enough money to be able to keep PCSOs. It's my intention to keep PCSOs for the foreseeable future. Excellent. Thank you. Any more questions for side? Uh, the Jane, um, have you got the microphone? Uh, East Hearts. Jane, Pittman East Hearts. Um, you talked about you were on a journey and you want to finish it. Where is this journey? Where are you going to Where is the end of this journey? I mean, surely it's not a. Well, you've never been on one of my magical mystery tours, clearly, uh, Jane. Um, I mean, the end of the journey. The, the, I suppose the honest answer is we won't know where the end of the journey is today. But we know where we're starting from, and that's not a bad, bad place. Where we're starting is uh, a place where crime is one of the lowest in the whole of the country, a place which is almost unique. There are only two forces in the whole country which haven't increased precept in the last four years. Um, a place where um, satisfaction in policing is the highest in the country. So we know that we're starting from a fairly good place. But actually, what this journey will take us through over the next uh, four, five years will be issues around collaboration. How do we work more with other organisations? I, I lead on collaboration with fire and ambulance nationally. We need to do even more work there. How do we work even more with Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire to make sure that the back offices are brought together more, to make sure that even some of that front-end delivery um, for, um, for example, roads policing for our major farming, and how that continues to, to work together. So we know that we've got to squeeze out even more money because we know that there will be grant cuts of up to 40%, and in policing, the grant is a bigger portion of what happens than it is um, in, for example, in other parts of local government. So we know that we've got some uh, difficulties ahead. We therefore want someone in place who has actually been through some of it and has had one of the better sets of outcomes, not one of the worst sets. Good. Good. Uh, my name is Michael Freeman from Waterman Stone, and where I'm one of your life-safe volunteers. Um, you've done a lot in recent years to encourage the use of volunteers to support the uniform branch. Would you like to tell us a bit more about how you see that developing, other areas in which volunteers can be used? Well, um, I was uh, at a, a Chief Constable's awards evening um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and sat next to someone who we were honouring, who was a special, who didn't work um, as a special out there, um, rolling around in the, in the mud and the blood on a Friday night at, outside a pub, he actually works as a special um, in IT. So by day he's an IT consultant, and then um, when he's got time off, he decides to volunteer his IT skills to uh, help and he's got far more knowledge around IT than frankly the majority of the constabulary have. My vision is that we use volunteers more and more. We use volunteers, for example, around policing. I wouldn't call um, specials specials in many ways. I'd call them, um, in the same way as we, we do for firefighters, call them retained police officers, because actually, in many places, that's exactly what they are. So um, if in every, and many people here who I, I, I recognise you know, live in more rural areas, in my home village of Flamstead, there are two specials who really provide all the policing for Flamstead, and everyone feels really safe. And actually, it doesn't cost us a lot of money either. So there are real ways of delivering policing through volunteers. 
And it's another thing that happens through volunteers, which is why I really do like having volunteer uh, custody visitors. That's why I like having volunteers around the dog police, and, uh, the, the dog visiting scheme, and all of those other things. Volunteers are part of that greater police family. And actually, you know my plan is called Everybody's Business? It's because the more people we have involved and inside and saying, this is about keeping our um, area <coughs> free from crime, the more likely it is we will be free from crime. And the more volunteers we get involved, the more that message spreads out. Okay, excellent. I think Richard in the very rear, you had a question. Thank you. Can show you that? This lady. Yeah, probably. Uh, Richard Thake. Wow. Turn the game down on this thing. Richard, Richard Thake, Neverton College, and I also have the privilege to be the community safety executive member for the, for the County Council. David, we all know that the, the frontline policing is about feeling the collar of, of those recalcitrants who, who want to break the law, but there's more to it, much more to it. And the work that uh, you have uh, supported in the preventative work and working with young people and those sections of society who haven't yet gone into crime but might is something that I find immensely important. Could you just give us a few words on whether or not or how you intend to continue that work and further? So, so in currently, um, we're policing about £200 million gross, £205 million spent in, in the constabulary. Um, but um, that shouldn't all be spent on policing, and nor is it. And indeed, I put, for example, at the moment, a disproportionate amount of money uh, out of the various agencies into adults with complex needs. Um, and that's because we need to find ways. I've, I've never yet met a victim of crime who said to me the thing that they most wanted to happen was that the police turned out quicker or that they found out who did it better or whatever. Or I've never yet found a victim of crime who said that's the only thing that they would want. Because, of course, what every victim of crime really wants is for the crime never to have taken place in the first place. And the way you get to that point is by working upstream. <coughs> it's by investing more in partner agencies. It's by making sure that there are sufficient social workers in place, frankly, to ensure that some of those breakdowns which otherwise happen don't happen. We all know, I'm sure, in this room that you know, a disproportionate amount of people in jail are illiterate, a disproportionate amount of people in jail were in the care system, a disproportionate amount of people in jail have parents who also were in jail. Should we be surprised? How many of us encourage our own kids to go into the same sort of job that we went into? Well, if you happen to be a housebreaker, the job that you've done is housebreaking. You encourage your kids to do it. You know, people learn that way. And we need to find ways of breaking that. The way we do it is by working together. So it's not about the front end. I, I often say, and thank you, you've heard me say many times, you know, we could run the health service um, in the same way uh, as um, those who want to run uh, crime reduction just through policing. And to do it in the same way would be to put all your money into A and E, and say so we won't bother with uh, the GPs, we won't bother with any of that public health end. All we'll do is put all our money into A and E. And when people finally fall over, we'll take them in an ambulance and we'll patch them up and send them back out again. Well, that would be ridiculous, and we'd all see that's ridiculous. And yet those same people will often say, the only place you need to put money is into frontline policing. They're wrong, and that's why I put a disproportionate amount of money into partner organisations like the County Council so we can work together to ensure the crime doesn't happen in the first place. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And I didn't even mention domestic abuse. Absolutely. <laughs> but I might if someone wants to. Okay. Okay. I'm Mary Stevenson. I'm District Council for King's Mead and Hartford. I've got a question about, there was um, some research I read about victims, not victims of crime, but victims of vulnerable people. And it said that, uh, I think apart from one police um, uh, in the country who actually had a, a diversion sign for people who are vulnerable while going through ordinary, if they've got sort of like small uh, instances where they don't understand they've committed something like carrying in mind for safety or something, but rather than putting through the system of being fingerprinted, photographed, Etc. Have you got any ideas on how you can actually do a diversion system for that? So I, I think what you're talking about is, um, as an example, those with learning disabilities who may well um, need to have ways of being treated better, um, more appropriately. 
Um, we have got um, schemes in place, and we are learning a lot. In fact, um, Andrew and I, between us, have learned a lot um, about um, some uh, particularly vulnerable um, uh, uh, offenders who are also victims within the system. And, and very often, of course, those who commit offences have also been offended against at some point as well. Um, clearly, uh, we need to ensure that um, there are appropriate adults in place. My learning from the particular things I allude to was that there, it doesn't happen frequently enough for those um, with um, learning disabilities. I'm working very hard to make sure that it does happen more. Um, we do have some very proud record within um, Hertfordshire around how we treat people who are in mental health crisis. Um, as, uh, as many people will be aware, something like 40, depending on where you are, 40 to 60 percent of those people who are in the criminal justice system actually have a mental health issue. Um, and uh, very often, um, in other parts of the country, it's been seen that the best place to take someone in crisis for their own safety but if they have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, they'll be taken to a police cell. Now, I can think of few worse places for someone who is having a mental health crisis to go than a police cell. Um, we were um, unique in the country in having neither a, a child, because unfortunately even children ended up there, neither a child nor any member of the public detained under the Mental Health Act um, into one of our police cells for the last two years. Um, that is really unusual. Um, uh, part of that, of course, is again how you work with the health service, especially the Mental Health uh, Trust, arts parts, um, how we ensure that there are the right facilities, the right secure facilities, that people can be taken swiftly. We've got two of those in Hertfordshire. One is better than the other. The one um, in the Radlett area is much better and much newer, I suppose, than the one um, around the back, as it seems, of the list of hospital in Stevenage. But all the same, at least we do have some secure places. They still are a problem for police, actually, because very often the police are required to remain with people who are in a mental health crisis and will be with them for perhaps five, six, seven, eight hours while the right um, uh, health uh, intervention um, happens. So there's still some way to go and some partnership work is with. Okay, good. Uh, I'll put the sample there. Then. Yes. Good evening, David. Uh, Councillor Graham said um, from Hell Hempstead. I'm sure I don't need to remind you of that. Um, at a um, neighbourhood meeting last week, uh, we had a representative from our local police officer, and she told us, um, as we already knew, when a local felon has his collar felt, um, he has to be uh, taken all the way to East Hertfordshire to be um, put into a cell. And I was uh, wondering when, if and when, we can actually have a, a proper hot, um, police station back in Hemel. Well, um, I, I, uh, I think that there are two or three questions which come up there. So some of it is uh, perhaps... I don't know how they, they put the response to you, but um, it certainly isn't the case that a, um, a, a person who has been uh, arrested and uh, put into police bail um, needs to go all the way to East Hertfordshire for that to happen. That, that, that is um, not true. Um, currently, um, we have two um, uh, facilities um, open, one in Hatfield and one in Stevenage. Um, and uh, there are also two other facilities um, which have recently closed for a number of reasons um, in Watford and Hoddesdon. Of course, the me most members of the public which you never have any real um, problem with not with having um, a cell open or not, because most members of the public never really um, get to see the full facilities that the uh, local constabulary can offer them. So at one level, it isn't a, it, it isn't a problem. Um, you are right, though, about you know when can we have um, a decent uh, police station in each place. And of course, you'll know that we not only do we currently have a police station open in Hemel Hempstead, but that also I am working 
uh, to ensure that we continue to have a facility not just in Hemel Hempstead, but in each borough and district. And you'll know how well I've worked with local councils to ensure that we have a brand new uh, sparkling uh, uh, facility in Rickmansworth, in uh, St Albans, uh, in uh, just through Hartsmere, Hartsmere, don't want to forget Hartsmere, Hartsmere, um, they have all got new facilities in the council offices and in due course, I heard it here first, in due course there will be one for Watford, in due course there will be one for Hemel Hempstead, it's something that I'm particularly working on at the moment because I think the way forward is to ensure that we show that partnership working by ensuring the place out of which the police come is in the same place, if at all possible, as the local council. It just makes sense to do that together. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Angela McMullen from East Hearts. Um, my question is, some weeks ago in the Mercury there was a big headline that so many people have not been able to get through to the police. Oliver Heald also expressed his surprise. He didn't know anything about it. It was that quite a lot of thousands and thousands of people calls were not able to get through. I just wondered if you had any comments about that and any improvements that you could think of. Thank you. Well, um, I have to say that I, um, I, I rarely um, sit back and think the Mercury is a paper which I necessarily take as the first point of truth or indeed accuracy almost on anything. In fact, only last week they were saying that uh, Japan meets South Africa at rugby, and uh, that can't possibly have been true, can it? So I, uh, um, but uh, the, um, uh, it's, I, I, I'm not convinced that it's quite true to say that thousands and thousands can't get through. However, I think um, the uh, thing that you're alluding to is 101 calls and how they are um, dealt. Um, 101 calls are slightly different to 999. There's a different um, length of time that people need to um, uh, sit on because they are not the urgent calls. Um, I'll, come, I'll come back at the end to, to, to where I'm going with it, but 999 call, every week I have a list down and I hold the Chief Constable to account on what's happening with both 999 calls and 101 calls. Um, both of them have had highs and lows through the year, and very often it's to do with um, how many people um, we've got uh, in the office at any one, uh, in, the, in the force control room at any one time, and how, how that um, uh, works through. The one thing that we can't have failing is the 999 system. It's the first port of call for everyone. But the second thing we can't have failing is the 101 system. And I have to say, over the last three or four years, I've heard far, far fewer people say to me, the 101 system isn't working. I, my vision is that we end up, that there are only two numbers that any member of the public in Hertfordshire needs to remember. If they are in a state of emergency, they dial 999. If they just have something they want to report about the public sector, they dial 101. That might mean that you say that your bin in West Mill or wherever hasn't been, um, hasn't been collected. And we know that because we know that sort of thing because we're, we're odd people and we know that's a district council function. That shouldn't matter. They should all be together and it should be for 101 to work out. And what's more, I would move it to 101.com as well and one at hashtag 101 so that you don't just have to phone. Because the big thing we've got to change is the amount of people calling in. We've got to make sure that the response is the right response um, to the public in the right place at the right time. And that's why I'm putting a lot of money into ensuring that we have a three-fourth system, which is even more efficient and more effective for the public. And I think we'll find that that system will mean that in four years' time, if we're still doing the same thing, you won't have to come back and ask me the same question. Okay, that's great. I've just really got a few seconds left, and there's a gentleman here who wants to uh, ask a question. It's a bit like University Challenge. I've started, so I'll be. <laughs> so if I can ask you to be brief with the response. You know I'm never brief with any response. That's just a bit too long. Yes, um, Eddie Roach, just a retired uh, gentleman these days. Um, 
Two we'll points. take that in part. <laughs> They're talking about money being scattered around on various uh, sections of the police. And I go along with what you've been doing. But uh, being the father of one, um, I'd like to know that uh, for sure that you never do anything about getting the shot of our police cadet system because that's a very, very good grounding uh, point. As I found out from my cost when my son was telling me various things about law. Um, the other thing is, is that you said earlier that you couldn't imagine a worse place than a police cell. Well, I could refer you to one or two police canteens that come in. That? <laughs> well, uh, you got inside knowledge there, and I won't try and answer the last one. But the cadets, you're quite right. I mean, that also picks up on um, on the whole issue of, of volunteers. You know, I think if you catch people young enough, even if they don't then want to go into the police, a lot of them do, you actually really brought people on in terms of citizenship. And that's why I've ensured that funding comes out of my office to uh, ensure that cadet schemes not only remain, but actually are expanded. And I've, uh, I'm really proud every year to go to, in, in July to Stanborough, where the police headquarters is, to see these young people in uniform who have had a wonderful weekend and actually done great things. And those really are quite inspirational people. So uh, I'll be keeping that going as long as I'm in Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Right, it's... Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the eyes to the right. Right, I'm pleased to announce that David Lloyd is your prospective candidate for election next year. Thank, thank you very much indeed for uh, showing confidence in me as I knock this over. Uh, again, it's, uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to, to be the candidate. We've got um, a lot to, uh, to do together. We've got a very good story to tell in Hertfordshire. Uh, we will... There is no place, I think, which would have such a good starting point as Hertfordshire to uh, fight as a Conservative um, for PCC. I'm delighted to do that on your behalf, and uh, I look forward to uh, the election ahead, which is one which we've got.